On the 19th of March 2016, the National Anti-Badger Call came to Plymouth. I was there to record their demonstration. So what does this mean for you? What does this mean for you? It means uh, we hope that the um, government will see sense and we can vaccinate uh, dairy cows eventually. Yes, vaccinate the cows instead of killing the badgers. And vaccinate we'll the badgers Well, we're well. Doing, already doing that badgers, in the West yeah. Bromwich. Yeah. They're being tested and um, euthanised. I don't think there's any sense in any form of politics whatsoever, so no, we well, don't we think they'll uh, We do uh, anti-hunt demos as well. We're, uh, we're ageing anarchists, aren't we, John? <laughs> so, oh, don't write yourselves off. Everybody's a get their, on about their ageing pillar. So where are you from? I'm from Zena, beyond St Ives, and he's from St Earth. Uh -huh. So how long has this been planned? The, uh, this, uh, this demonstration? Well, we just were in touch with the uh, people doing the vaccination in Plymouth, so, you know, they <coughs> email us. Uh -huh. well, yeah. Thanks a lot, okay, thank Cheers. Bother to find out the facts, care enough to take some action and come out and show it. And that is incredibly helpful. So give yourself all a round of applause to start with. There are a few people to thank for today, primarily Jenny and all the helpers from the Devon Badger Group and one or two others and Gavin who's done the PA and Marcus job. So thank you all, all of those as well. So we've um, hopefully going to have a good event. It's, it's great to see so many people. My job is just basically to introduce the speakers and probably talk about a few things in between. And what I would want to say to start off with, and I will be eventually as well if I'm presenting the, the car of shame to one or two local people, nobody in the crowd hopefully, but one or two local people. Um, but what I would say is, and I take the words from a chap called Tony Benn, some of you know Tony Benn, he's uh, dead and gone now, but he talked about the establishment of the establishment. And I'll read you what he said, because I can never remember the exact words. And I think it's, it's quite important really, because it actually puts us into a context that we find ourselves in currently, but in actual fact, this goes back to feudal times. Whoops. Not what Tony Benn said was, I don't think people realise how the establishment became established. It simply stole the land and property off the poor, surrounded themselves with weak-minded sycophants for protection, gave themselves titles and have been wielding power ever since. Now, despite what you might think, I don't believe we live in a democracy. I believe we live in basically a feudal system. Uh, so I said it's just much more disguised nowadays, it is much more um, sinister because we have people in positions of authority, people that influence the whole of our society in a way to meet their own ends. And despite what people might say or might think, I happen to think that our government are very good at that, are very adept at that. But it's not just the government, it's people like the infamous National Farmers Union who put themselves in a position of authority claim to represent the farming industry, but in actual fact, less than 20% of farmers are members of the NFU, yet they claim to speak for the NFU. They claim to be the spokesman for that industry that we all depend on and we all rely on, uh, whether we eat meat and vegetables, or whether we eat just vegetables, or whether we drink milk or don't drink milk. We still depend on food, and that the farming industry provides us with that food. And unfortunately, the farmers generally, and we all think it, the problem with the badger call is the farmers. It's not the problem with the farmers by and large. It's more to do with government and farmers in the NFU, and the NFU world in power. So don't have it in for all farmers. Some of them are on our side. Anyway, before I say any more and get carried away, I'm going to introduce our first speaker. And our first speaker, in actual fact, has a farming background. And you all know her wherever she happens to be hiding. You all know, I suspect, of a place called Secret World Wildlife Rescue in Somerset, renowned for its wildlife rescue, renowned for its factory rehabilitation and release scheme, and the founder of that organization, and still very much part of it, is Pauline Kidner. says I've got a background in, in farming and therefore know many, many farmers. And you know, it really is important that we do remember that a lot of farmers don't want their badgers um, touched in any way. 
And it's really interesting when I go around the village to find so many farmers that are uh, wanting their badges to survive and, and any other places as well. So, you know, as Adrian says, don't, don't uh, be too hard on the farmers because remember the majority of our badges actually live on farms and that's why to a certain extent we want to keep them as friends. Over the years, Secret World has been involved with badgers and particularly with badger cubs. And just as an example, I'm going to tell you about a little cub that we've got in at the moment that's called Diamond Dave. Um, he was brought in about a week ago, was picked up by somebody out walking, I thought the badger was going to go, um, out walking with his dog Jack Russell, who normally kills things, but luckily he picked up this little cub, bought it and dropped it as his feet, and he took it to a garden nursery, and it was then passed on to us. I just don't I open their eyes until they're five weeks old. And he is the size of a cub that is about uh, two weeks old. So what's happened is he's come out of the set, he's been able to keep himself warm in the undergrowth, but I reckon he hasn't had any food for at least two weeks. Badger cubs are just as strong as badgers, and I want you to remember that because as I finish my speech, that actually is very, very important for you to know how long they can survive for. We actually were involved with shot badgers that have been brought into us because sadly we've been close to the Somerset Cull. We've seen lots of badgers brought into us, sometimes RTA, but we actually had three badgers brought into us from the Cull. The first one would have died quickly, but it didn't look very nice because it had been shot through the chest, but out through the side, taking the intestines with it. The second one was one that was shot illegally with the wrong ammunition and in the correct, incorrect place and would have taken several minutes to die. And then we had a third one in the third year as well. So we've seen, unfortunately, what the cull is all about, which is really killing badgers very cleverly because if a badger is injured, the one thing it will always try to do is get them back to the set. So if they're injured and capable of doing it, they will get back to their set and we will never see them. And so there's a huge amount of cruelty going on. But I can tell you as a wildlife rescue center, not just us, but other people are seeing there is a huge increase in badger persecution. And it's not just happening during the culling time, it's happening now. And just as an example, I'm going to get Adrian to stand out the front and show you the photographs. This is a badger that was brought into us um, on Sunday. To a, uh, one of our staff actually heard shooting. She went out with a friend and found this badger dead, but on a path where she was desperately trying to get back to her set. She's been shot underneath the rib cage, so it would have gone straight through. And the report from the vet said that she would have taken minutes or hours to die because she would have bled out. This is her. The only crime she committed was the fact that she was a badger. And it shows you if Adrian put it up the other way, you might be able to read the reading <laughs> writing. But it just tells you the fact that, you know, the only crime was that she was a badger and she was shot, obviously nowhere near a co area nowhere near a time when culling should be going ahead and that's one that one was brought into us on Sunday unfortunately we were to see that she was a lactating female and we know from seeing badgers that are lactating that that very small circle around the teat means that she's got very very young cubs and that's what she was trying to get back to so that's what we have young female in good condition she weighed 10 kilos shot with a rifle through the abdomen she would have bled to death or died of shock death not likely to be instant and it would have taken minutes to hours to die her cubs will be dying now they will only be seven days old if not less this is what they're going to look like and they will be taking their last breaths this weekend and there's nothing we can do about it. Even if we found the set, even if we heard them crying, we couldn't get down to them. This is happening every night. We have got to stop it. It's not just the cull, it's all the persecution. And it's easy, you know, it's not just badgers. I mean, it's great that we're here for the badgers, but there's out there shooting foxes, the hair coursing. There's just so much going on that we've got to stop. It's really great to see all the different ages here today because it's the youngsters we want in there to really help us change what is going on in our countryside.
thank you to all of you for coming, and I'll hand you over to the next speaker. Thank you. Before I pass on to the next speaker, I think I want to just have a couple of points that Pauline's just made. And one of them is that you may have seen the new DEFRA guidelines in National England for the issue of licenses that were was published in, back in December. And in that, uh, those guidelines, it allows for culling to take place until the end of January, which means that we will almost certainly be seeing indiscriminate killing of lactating females and heavily pregnant females. And that, to me, is a, puts into perspective the hollow claims that the local director of the Cornwall NFU made in the Tunneth Herald a week or so ago in Western Morning News. I think someone's here from Western Morning News, so I'll take it on board, Guy. Um, and that is the fact that the, this Mr. Howlett said that uh, we should not come to the march if we had any conscience, effectively, because we should be thinking about the cows and the calves and the suckler calves that die because of bovine TV. They're being put to, to sleep because of bovine TV. Yeah, he had no thought for the badger cubs and the badger lactating females and the badger pregnant females. So a bit of a hollow claim, really, to get us to try and to win a sympathy vote over us not to be here today. So the fact that you're here shows that you have got sympathy for farmers, I think, but you've got more sympathy for badgers in terms of what's happening to them. I'll speak again a bit more about Mr. Howlett and also a couple of other local people. I've been trying to look at local news to get something, uh, give you a local flavour. I've got a couple of things to talk about later um, when it comes to the award of the car at the shame. Anyway, before I go any, into any more, I say I'm going to hand you over to the next speaker now. And Mark is a, a veterinary. Mark is a veterinary. He's done an awful lot of work to try to convince the veterinary associations that badger cutting is not correct and it's not the right thing to do. And he's, he's tirelessly working to, to convince the veterinaries they should be looking at it in a much more different way. So I'll hand over to Mark. Thanks very much, Adrian. Um, as Adrian says, my name's Mark. I work for the Born Free Foundation. Um, I'd like to add my thanks for everyone for coming to this march. I don't know how many of these marches there's been now. This is something like the 34th or 35th. And I'm, I'm always... Um, so um, just impressed in awe uh, of the numbers of people that turn out uh, to demonstrate their opposition to this inhumane, ineffective and completely inexcusable policy. Uh, I'd like to thank the organisers and my fellow speakers. Uh, again, it's always fantastic to hear the, the, from people who do amazing work like Pauline, you'll hear from Dominic in a bit, and of course Adrian. Um, you know, all these people are working really hard all the time uh, to try and protect our badges and, and bring this policy to an end. Um, I've had quite a long involvement in this campaigning on this issue. Uh, I've been involved from the veterinary side, which I'll come to. Uh, I've been involved in wounded badger patrols, particularly in Gloucestershire. And again, the people who go out night after night when these culls are going on, uh, and j just to try and observe peacefully walking the, the paths, peacefully checking out the sets, uh, are a real inspiration. And if badger culling does come to Devon and to Cornwall, as it looks as if it might, uh, then I, I, I really hope and encourage you know and encourage you to uh, to get out there and and support those those peaceful protests that go on during the calls. They're so important. Um, as many of you will know, Born Free, the organisation I work for, was co-founded by the actress Virginia McKenna, who starred in the film Born Free, which was released uh, 50 years ago this year. Virginia isn't able to be here today, but she does feel passionately about the badger cull issue, and she's asked me to read a. a a short statement to you. Um, so this is from Virginia McKenna. Not only does there seem to be no logic in possibly extending the Badger Cull to, in this case, to, to Devon, or any other county for that matter, but this plan also means the decision makers have disregarded the suffering caused to the Badgers by the culling methods used. Little by little, wild creatures are being eliminated from nature. It would seem that the authorities never consider what wild animals contribute to the balance of the natural world. They waste thousands, millions of pounds on this slaughter as if, as if there was no alternative to defeat the transmission of TB to cattle. There is an alternative. It's cattle measures, it's vaccination. The choice is life for all, not death. That's from Virginia McKenna, and she's, uh, she's asked me to thank everyone for coming today and uh, to, to assure you that she's with us every step of the way. 
We've had three years of Badger Culls in Somerset and Gloucestershire. Dorset was added last year. Almost 4,000 badgers have been killed under licence to date, almost none of which have been tested for bovine TB, and the overwhelming majority of which will have been perfectly healthy and will have posed no risk to anyone or anything. Now this year, 29 new applications for culling licences in the west and southwest of England have been uh, received by Natural England. In total, they cover an area of about 10,000 square kilometres. That's about the size of Yorkshire, our largest county. Now we don't know exactly where these new applications have come from and which areas they apply to, although we know that about 25 of them are for culls here in the southwest, and it's expected, it's widely expected, that at least five or six of these areas will receive licenses this year, more probably in the years to come. Some of them will almost undoubtedly be here in Devon and, and across in Cornwall. This policy could see at least 50,000 more badgers killed over the coming years, and the population of badgers across the west and southwest of England reduced by up to a half. Now, no one denies that TB is a big issue for farmers. Uh, back in 2014, some 33,000 cattle were slaughtered prematurely because of the disease. Uh, it's cost the taxpayer probably 500 million in the last 10 years in testing costs, in compensation costs for farmers, and outbreaks cost individual farms many thousands of pounds, notwithstanding the disruptions to businesses and the emotional cost to the farmers themselves. Bear in mind that most of these costs are associated not with the effects of the disease itself, but with how we go about trying to control it. And this situation has come about not because of badgers, as many in the government and the NFU would, would have you believe, but because of inadequate controls and poor industry practices over many years. Just because the costs of cattle TB are high, this is not an excuse for laying the blame on innocent wild animals. Farmers have been duped by the government and the National Farmers Union into believing that killing badgers will somehow help to purge the curse of bovine TB, which devastates so many farming businesses and so many farmers' lives. And in trying to defend this policy, the government and the National Farmers Union will say, well, they'll say various things. They'll say, you can't get TB under control without dealing with the reservoir in badgers. This is not true. The only real piece of science designed to look at the impact of killing badgers on TB in cattle was something called the Randomised Badger Culling Trial. It was a government-sponsored trial. It took about 10 years, cost about £50 million, and it cost 11,000 badgers their lives. And the conclusions of the scientists who undertook that trial was that badger culling can make no meaningful contribution to the control of TB in cattle in Britain. The government and the NFU will say no country has controlled TB successfully without dealing with the wildlife reservoir. This is not true. Here in the UK, we got bovine TB under control from a very bad situation back in the late 1950s and early 60s through strict controls over cattle movements and trade, 10 years before we even knew that badgers could get bovine TB. And as the New Zealand Minister Richard Prosser stated last year, the single biggest reservoir and vector for bovine tuberculosis is cattle. It's always been cattle. Government and the NFU will say shooting badgers is a humane way of killing them because it's no different from shooting other kinds of wildlife. This is simply not true. After the first year of these culls in Gloucestershire and Somerset, the government's own appointed panel of experts found that up to a quarter of the badgers that were shot at probably took more than five minutes to die. And these experts concluded that these badgers were therefore at risk of experiencing marked pain and suffering. And to imply other wild animals that are shot don't suffer is clearly completely ridiculous and indefensible. 
And the government and the NFU will say budget culls are already working. They'll claim that the culls that have been going on in Gloucestershire and Somerset and in Dorset in recent years are already having an impact on bovine TB. This is not true. Even our chief vet, our chief government vet, who's a big supporter of budget culls, admits it's impossible to draw any such conclusions and there's even some evidence that the culls that have been taking place over the past few years are making things worse for farmers and let's not forget illegal budget persecution has increased massively around the cull zones something the government and the nfu don't seem to be taking very seriously and something an example of which we've just heard pauline talking about today and lastly, the government and NFU will say, we need to use all the tools in the box. I'm sorry, that's the most absurd argument I've ever heard. You don't use all the tools in the box, you use the tools that work and that don't involve the wholesale slaughter of wildlife. Killing badgers should never be a tool for controlling TB in cattle. The message from government and the NFU is nothing more than rhetoric and lies. Farmers, cattle and their wildlife are all being badly let down by this messaging. Now, a lot of folk I speak to are surprised to hear that my profession, the veterinary profession, has played a big part in the development and promotion of this badger culling policy. Now, badger culling is supported by a lot of individual vets who seem to think they should do whatever their farm clients ask of them. It's supported by the British Veterinary Association, which is heavily influenced by vested interests within the profession. And it's supported by our chief government vet and his staff, presumably because their jobs depend on it. Now, I'm often asked why vets, who above all should be looking out for the welfare of animals, would support the wholesale slaughter and unjustified slaughter of badgers. The problem here is that many vets simply don't understand the science behind the control of TB. Many vets have vested interest, and a lot of vets will also claim that the welfare of badgers or other wild animals is nothing to do with them because these animals are not directly under their care. Well, let me say this. Before supporting badger culls, or for that matter, any kind of harmful wildlife interventions, vets and our professional bodies, like the British Veterinary Association, had better be damn sure there will be a substantial and guaranteed benefit from those interventions. Be damn sure there's no alternative to those interventions. Be damn sure the methods are gonna, that are going to be used are humane. And be absolutely confident that there won't be any other consequences for animal welfare, like illegal persecution. These badger culls fail on every single one of these counts. And the veterinary profession, my profession and its professional bodies, has absolutely no business supporting them. Now, a number of my veterinary colleagues, including several eminent professors in their field, and, and myself, have approached the BVA again this year, asking the organisations to re-examine its support for badger culling on the grounds that tens of thousands more badgers will be targeted over the coming years, many of them using methods which even the British Veterinary Association itself has admitted have not been shown to be humane. Sadly, I have to say that the President and officers of the British Veterinary Association have refused to even meet with us to discuss the matter. I have to say that the attitude of many of my colleagues particularly those with influence in the British Veterinary Association, who seem to think badgers are little more than an expendable, expendable nuisance, has made me ashamed to be a member of the profession I worked so hard to join 30 years ago. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this, this isn't just about the 4,000 poor badgers who have lost their lives for no good reason in the West Country over the past three years. It's not even about the 50,000 or more badgers, just about the 50,000 or more badgers that could be killed over the coming years. It's about the attitudes of our government, our industries, our vets, and our society towards our wildlife. Wild animals are disappearing fast all over the world, and we're systematically destroying the nature on which we all ultimately depend. In its election manifesto, this government, our current government, stated, and I quote, our moors and meadows, wildlife and nature, air and water, are crucial, 
are a crucial part of our national identity and make our country what it is. So we care about them deeply, want to protect them for everyone and pass them on to future generations. Well, all I can say is that the indiscriminate killing of badgers for no good reason isn't much of a way of fulfilling that commitment. Blaming wildlife for the problems we create and licensing the slaughter of tens of thousands of innocent wild animals is just not good enough and this government and the proponents of this obscene policy need to hear that message loud and clear. So what can you do? What can we do? Well, I think you've already made a difference just by coming out on this cold day in Plymouth today and making sure your voice and your opposition to this travesty is heard. If you can, please go down to the cold zones later this year. If Let's hope they don't come to this area, but if they do, please go down to the zones and take part in the peaceful patrols that take place each and every night through the culling periods to try and protect badgers from harm. And keep writing to your councillors, MPs, MEPs, the Environment Minister, even the Prime Minister, to remind them of just how much public opposition to this policy there is. Let me be absolutely clear, badger culling is unscientific, it's ineffective, it's inhumane and it's entirely unnecessary. This travesty, travesty of a policy must be brought to an end. Thank you very much. I should be awarded the car a shame in a moment or two. Um, but before I do, what I will say, one of the stick now, like a lollipop. Um, what I will say is that um, I took the trouble to try and find some local news. And I used the infamous paper called the Western Morning News. Um, and the Plymouth, the Plymouth, I think it was called Plymouth Herald, I can't remember now. Well, I found a couple of things in there that um, prompted me to think about the car at a shame. Um, one of them was a, a quote by um, Nat Matters, the Vice President of the National Farmers Union, who was uh, quoted as saying something along the lines that um, we've got no statistical evidence that says whether the culls were working or not working after the first year's uh, uh, of observations by the Animal Plant and Health Association, um, who look after um, wildlife for DEFRA. Um, but then the next breath, the her organization says that, um, well, we, um, we can say the coals are working, but we haven't got any evidence to prove that, but we, are, we know they are working because somebody said they were, or worse to that effect. Um, and I want to say that um, the strange thing is that the statistics that have been gathered at the moment are being suppressed. And I suddenly thought to myself, why are they suppressing the statistics? Because is it because on April the 1st, they're bringing more cattle movement restrictions in? And will that mean that bovine TB will then reduce because the cattle restrictions are in? And they say, hooray! Badger cutting works. Look, the badger cull is obviously working, bovine TB is going down. So I think, Yen, if you've got a few questions to answer. I made a reference earlier as well to uh, the local director of Cornwall NFU, Mr. Martin Hewitt, about the fact that he said you shouldn't be here, uh, or at least you should think very seriously about being here because of the sympathy you should have for the calves and things that are, that are dying um, because of bovine TB. Um, and I think that's a, you know, one of the reasons why he's going to be one of the joint uh, winners of the award for the Car of Shame. So the award for the Car of Shame is partly going to the local NFU director for Cornwall. Now, in addition to that, I was looking at the Farmers Weekly and uh, one of their results, or one of their surveys they've done on Ford and Stock. And this is um, to do with the Beef Association and the beef cattle industry. And uh, I noticed that uh, there was a top 10 diseases or top 10 reasons for fallen stock. And through all the categories, well, some of them were to do with calves being born dead, some were to do with the, when, they're, when the calf stage of the operation, and some when they were older in terms of past being suckler herds. And uh, the strange thing was, there was 10 reasons given for all these animals to die. And on all 10 of all three categories, bovine TB was not mentioned at all. So the other joint award winner of the Car at a Shame is the Beef Association chairman who lives in Devon, a chap called Bill Harper. Uh, so the award is going to both of them, both of them because they, they both resist uh, anything other than killing badgers. 
both of them because they resisted the new government, the new uh, cattle movement uh, restrictions being put on April the 1st. So the color of shame goes to those two. This has been Chris Mafia Media Production Documentary 2016. You can contact me through Facebook and Twitter. You can also sponsor me and support me through PayPal at ChristopherSimphil at gmail.com. Thanks for watching the video.